Um, I think Luke's talk has set me up really well. I think that was a great introduction to where we're going with principles of practice. Um, I think I want to follow up with that with a little bit of a review of how far we've come uh, and in particular how far we've come both before and after the Amphibian Conservation Action Plan. So the ACAP, as I think everybody knows, uh, came, flowed from the Amphibian Conservation Summit that was held in Washington in 2005. And that meeting defined a number of themes within which we decided to try and come up with a strategy for amphibian conservation. Originally at the meeting, I think there were 11 themes and when the document was finally produced in 2007, there were a few more added. But I think the key thing was that both captive programs and reintroductions uh, featured strongly within the ACAP. And indeed, in the original meeting at Washington, there was some debate because certainly some amphibian conservation scientists thought there was too much emphasis on captive programs and reintroductions. And it was rather overshadowing some of the other efforts that were actually going on. I'm not going to go into that at the moment, but uh, safe to say that captive programs and reintroductions have been part of the ACAP since the outset and still form a significant part of the amphibian conservation initiative. So what we did before the ACAP came out, we published this paper, which was based on uh, Seth Abishal's work, where we tried to review the range of captive breeding, reintroduction and conservation programs of amphibians that were going on, where they were occurring, how successful they were, taxonomic biases, were they tackling species, etc. And it just so happened by a pure coincidence that this study fell quite neatly into what we might call the pre ACAP uh, period, because we reviewed studies from about 1966 up till about 2006. So when the ACAP came out and uh, a few years on from 2007, we thought it would be useful to review this once again and see if there's been any changes post that ACAP. So effectively we repeated the process and again this was mainly Gemma's work, who will talk after me, uh, reviewing what had actually gone on in terms of amphibian captive breeding reintroduction from 2007 up to 2013. Of course 2013 that is now what six years ago so I suspect that things have moved on again since, since then. So in some ways this is a little bit of a historical perspective. When we set out to do this work we thought well what are the key questions we need to tackle? What are the key things we want to find out from the information that is actually out there? Well one fairly basic one was how many conservation breeding and reintroduction programs are there actually going on? What is the scale of it? And then what are the changes since the ACAP in terms of uh, the threats to species in captive breeding and reintroduction programs, in terms of the geographical regions where these initiatives are actually happening? Uh, the red list status, has this changed in emphasis since the ACAP? and have the reasons for captive breeding evolved over time. And then there's what, what is actually driving these changes. If, the, if there are changes going on, what are the main things that have, have driven them uh, in the directions that they're actually going? And probably the most fundamental question, I mean, actually how successful is captive breeding and reintroduction as a conservation strategy for amphibians? So how did we do this? Well, we adopted a, a multifaceted approach. We reviewed and interrogated a range of publications, including uh, uh, Mickey Suri's uh, wonderful Global Reintroductions Perspectives document, which uh, Luke's already talked about. We sifted through Froglog over the years to see what information was in there. 
We interrogated databases such as Amphibia Web. Amphibian Arc was probably the most comprehensive source of information and the Red List as well. We also looked at other publications, peer reviewed publications, so we used standard search terms for interrogating literature, which generated other studies as well. We also talked to the experts, um, although Gemma probably had the fun part of doing that, meeting the interesting people that are involved with amphibian conservation around the world, and also visiting uh, various projects to find out what was actually going on firsthand. So some basic summary of some of the information we pulled out of that. So if we first of all ask the question, have programs increased? Well, before the ACAP, we identified 62 species in reintroduction programs. Now in doing this, we, we had some additional criteria. This, this doesn't include species involved with mitigation programs because we regarded those as not having conservation as a specific goal. The mitigation translocations are usually carried out to really reduce the human wildlife conflict. Sometimes there are conservation spin-offs um, but we excluded those because there's a large number of those, probably the same number again and we wanted to focus specifically on those that had a conservation goal. We also eliminated what we might call backyard releases. Um, so to qualify for our, within our database, the species act, actually had to have some formal documentation that made it resonate within a conservation program. Because once again, there's probably hundreds and thousands of people around the world that are just moving frog eggs around for fun uh, without really having an explicit conservation goal. So with those criteria we identified 62 species up to 2006 that were involved in reintroductions and those really fell into two groups. 41 of those species had a captive component and 21 of those species had no captive component. So those, these were sort of wild to wild translocations uh, that didn't involve captivity. In doing that, we should say that sometimes it's a little bit difficult to identify what is in situ and what is ex situ. There are grey areas of a captive component. Um, even if you're taking tadpoles out for head starting, that is clearly um, a program that has a captive component. If you're actually doing head starting in situ, possibly actually protecting spawn, then that would be ex situ. So there are some gray areas here between what is in situ and ex situ. So we, again, we de defined a captive component if involved any stages, bringing them into captivity uh, for part of that program. So the captive component involved 41 species. In addition to that, there was conservation breeding but not for release for 74 species. So these are species that are part of conservation programs but primarily for activities relating to conservation education and conservation research and these included those species that there was so far no explicit plan for reintroduction into the wild but they're still serving a conservation purpose. So if we add on to these the post ACAP data from 2007 to 2013, we found over this relatively short period of time that there were 13 new species in reintroduction programs. And that comprised 12 new species that, were, that had a captive component and just one species that actually had no captive component, a wild to wild, um, translocation. And those species that were in conservation breeding but not for release had actually increased by 64 species. So there was a large number of species coming into captive breeding uh, but not explicitly for release. A lot of these, as we shall see in a minute, 
but related to species where things such as disease research is actually going on. So if you look at these time frames, obviously 1966 to 2006 is a much longer time frame than 2007 to 2013. But what we saw was a 57% increase in just seven years in captive breeding and reintroduction programs. And what was also apparent here was that there were relatively few new reintroductions. A lot of species going into captive breeding programs, but actually um, relatively few, only one, as we see here, that, uh, sorry, but very few new reintroduction programs overall uh, within the data that we actually got. So some examples of the post -cap, a cap reintroductions, here's uh, some of the species that we know have been released uh, since the ACAP. Um, and again, there may well be other species to actually add to this list, since this actually only goes up to about 2013. The mountain chicken frog here, uh, Leptodactylus phallax. Uh, I'm sure you may hear a little bit more from Matt Goats about that. That is subject to quite an exciting reintroduction program that doesn't have the goal of re-establishing the population. It has the goal of testing to see whether released frogs can actually manage their own chytrid infection through habitat manipulation. So this is a reintroduction, as I say, that is experimental and it's more of a research related reintroduction than one to establish uh, a self-sustaining population. This graph shows uh, pre-ACAT threatened species and the different colours refer to the different types of programmes. So the yellow bars just refer to those species in captive breeding only, the uh, purple bars, captive breeding and reintroduction, where there has been a release component, and the green bars just involving reintroduction. And you can see that pre ACAP, the principal threat to those species that were in the programs is actually habitat loss. Perhaps not entirely surprising because we still uh, now realise that habitat loss is the primary threat to amphibians uh, globally. If we look at it post day cap, there's some changes. First of all, as I mentioned earlier, the proportion of reintroductions has fallen um, and there's relatively more going into captive breeding. And the other thing that we see here is that the proportion of species threatened by disease has increased in these programs uh, since the ACAP. And if we test those distributions before and after the ACAP, we can see a significant change. So there has been a shift in the species that have gone into captive breeding and reintroduction programs post ACAP in relation to the principal threats that they face within the wild. If we now turn to where these captive breeding and reintroduction programs have been happening globally and we can see the green bars represent post ACAP and the purple bars pre ACAP. Again we can see um, a shift here. Um, post ACAP there seems to be uh, a relative increase in the number of South American species and in the number of Central and Caribbean species that have been involved in these programs and a relatively a relative drop in Europe and uh, places such as Australia and New Zealand and North America. So in addition to there being a shift in emphasis towards species with different types of threats, there's been a shift in the geographical areas where these programs are actually happening. And again, that shift is actually significant. If we have a look at IUCN red list categories, so again this graph here shows the number of species in the different IUCN red list categories, again categorised into our three criteria, captive breeding, captive breeding and reintroduction, reintroduction only. And you can see quite clearly here that the vast majority of species that were in programme <coughs> 
were actually least concerned. And this has always been a criticism of captive breeding in the introduction, in that it's not actually focusing on the species that actually need it most. So if we look at what's actually happened post ACAT, we can see a reassuring shift towards threatened species. So far fewer least concerned species and rather more shifting down into these threatened IUCN categories. And with most of the species uh, focusing on the critically endangered species. So that's actually been um, a reassuring shift. And it means that the programs are now focusing uh, a lot more on threatened species than they used to. And again, that shift is shown to be significant. So what are the highly successful reintroductions? We, again, there's, if you look in the literature, there are all sorts of different ways of defining success. Um, we used a fairly simple uh, definition of highly highly successful we defined as there had to be evidence of a self-sustaining population the animals had to be demonstrating that the population was breeding not just breeding but it was turning over and was self-sustaining under its own steam we called medium levels of success whether there was evidence of breeding and low levels of success whether there was just evidence of the animals surviving so in some ways this these species here show photographs of slow species which is good evidence have managed to found self-sustaining populations now one of the things that we wanted to do but we were unsuccessful was to do a nice statistical model to try and determine what the predictors were of these highly successful reintroductions. We have a lot of information about these in terms of life histories, uh, habitat use, um, various socioeconomic factors associated with them, but that proved quite tricky for all sorts of reasons, really mainly because our sample sizes weren't really very large enough in relation to the numbers of predictors that we were interested in. But I think there's one thing that stood out quite clearly in these highly successful reintroductions, and that was that they've been long term. If you look at the New York and midwife toad, for example, that's a species, well, probably now been going on for 30 years, but it took about 20 years to really establish that that species was successful. And it's now estimated that probably about 25% of the toads in the wild in the mountains of New York are stemmed from uh, captive breeding and reintroduction. Another one is the Natterjack toad in Britain. Again, a very long term project, and it's taken about 25 years of monitoring to really be able to say, put our hands on our hearts and say, yes, we think that's been successful. And then uh, Hyla arborea in Latvia, that's a slightly shorter term one of eight years. Uh, we've got 12 years for. Um, Roma's frog and so on. So I think the key message here is that if you're going in for reintroductions you have to be in there for the long term. These are not short-term projects and it does require quite a lot of long-term monitoring in order to pick these up. As we all know amphibian population dynamics are quite chaotic at times. There's lots of background noise and to try and determine whether they are successful or not means you are not really looking at it in terms of number of years, you look at it in terms of the number of generations that they're actually going through. Another feature of, that really emphasised the importance of time was the programme duration. And again, this is, these are data that Gemma pulled together, but if we actually look at the average duration of a programme, and we look at this in relation to low levels of success. Simply, there's evidence that there are animals there, medium levels of success, they're breeding, and high levels of success, that there's evidence that the population is viable. Then we can see, you can clearly see that you need more years for more levels of success. And we found that programs running for less than about seven years 
really is not enough time to demonstrate high levels of success. And only about 2% of programs show the high level of success if they were running for less than 10 years. So this really reiterated the importance of long-term monitoring and being in for, for the long haul when you're doing these types of programs. So there's a few things changing here and we thought we sat down and had to think about what the reasons might be. Um, first of all, uh, about 3% of all amphibian species are part of exit through conservation programs. That's about 7% of all threatened species. We have seen a shift in captive breeding in Latin America and the Caribbean and a relative decrease in North American Europe. Interestingly, about half of the programs involve zoos and aquaria and half of them don't. So those that don't involve zoos and aquaria are often government or private captive breeding and reintroduction facilities. Um, and there's a small proportion of programs that involve both government and private and zoos and aquaria programs. But although zoos and aquaria are often um, the main proponents of captive breeding and conservation uh, for amphibians and other taxa, they're not necessarily the main deliverers. There's been an increase in species threatened by disease within the programs. And again, I think that simply reflects the increase in interest and realization of the importance of disease. And there's been an increase in critically endangered species. So a shift towards those species that need it more. But there has been a decreased emphasis on reintroduction compared to earlier years. And again, I think this is largely down to the fact that we are starting to realize that there's not much point in doing reintroductions um, if threats are still evident within the wild. And some of these threats are complex and difficult to mitigate, particularly disease and climate change. So there has been a shift in the role of amphibians in captive breeding and reintroduction in that we're using them more to, to learn, to understand about threats and how we might mitigate them rather than just as providing stock for releases back into the wild. So this is comes across here where I just say there's been this increased emphasis on captive assurance populations and research, disease development of probiotics uh, and so on. So just to sort of finish off uh, before I hand over to Gemma, so the IUCN SSC ASG has been working on the new Amphibian Conservation Action Plan, which is a more of a living document. The previous document was just produced. This is one that is uh, a more of a virtual document. It's been evolving online. Uh, we've been involved in developing the uh, reintroductions component of this. And uh, the goals of the revised IUCN uh, Amphibian Conservation Action Plan are just listed here. And effectively what we've been trying to do with the action plan is to try and work out what's actually going on to try and prioritize it, who's doing what, and also identify where things actually need uh, to go uh, within the future. Uh, so, and I think the timing of the reintroduction guide, the amphibian reintroduction guidelines is, is therefore, uh, I think it's very timely in that it's coming about uh, around about the same time that this document is, uh, is evolving as well. That's pretty much all I want to say. Just thank you to a large number of uh, people that helped us with this uh, throughout uh, the whole of the, the process of data uh, assimilation and to everyone who was uh, badgered for information. I'll say Gemma did most of that work um, and we're very grateful for the large number of people who shared often unpublished information that allowed us to um, produce the information. That we Great. Okay, well, Richard's stolen a bit of my presentation, but um, yeah, what I was going to do is just talk a bit more about the um, Amphibian Conservation Action Plan and what the reintroduction group is um, 
trying to do um, and doing um, in terms of implementing some of the actions. So Richard's already uh, covered most of this. Um, so the original ACAP was in 2007, um, which followed the Global Amphibian Assessment and basically was a, a way to document this big call to society and scientific community for urgent um, help and implementation of, of actions to help halt the decline of amphibians. And yeah, there were, I think, nine uh, working groups of which reintroductions is one of them. And the, these groups, the, if you look at the original conservation action plan, that they vary uh, quite a lot. And some give general guidance. Uh, the reintroduction chapter talks about guidance for general, general reintroductions and a bit about what they want to achieve. Some have a few actions, but it's, it's quite inconsistent in terms of it doesn't have uh, cl clear actions and targets set out. And as Richard mentioned, there's groups that stem from all these uh, chapters and working groups are formed, I think mainly based around the original authors, although I think some of these groups have, have morphed over time. And yeah, they're working together to implement the action plan. So that that's just shows you a sample of, of the reintroduction chapter from the original um, action plan. So the plan was revised in 2015. And as Richard was saying, it's very much a, a live document now. And we've actually input into that and, and change things online and try to make it more user friendly and, and lay out direct actions. And each group has done that. So you, you can see that from the link here to the website. So our group, it's uh, co-chairs are myself and Richard, and then we have a small working group of people that's formed of people who are interested in reintroductions, people who are very experienced, um, and then we have support from amphibian specialist group lead uh, and Sally Wren in our case. So our overall desire vision is that amphibian species uh, will be surviving in self-sustaining populations that reintroductions are no longer needed. That is the dream. Um, we're a long way from that, unfortunately. Uh, Richard put up our goals. I won't go through them, but they're, they're just very general overall goals uh, for the reintroduction group. And these are the actions uh, we've laid out. We've we tried to um, narrow them down we worked alongside with the captive breeding group because a lot of our our actions and constraints overlap um, as you'd expect so we kind of put our heads together and came up with the actions um mid-term priorities short-term targets with the aim of working on the short-term targets first and then moving on to the the bigger priorities and some of these are things that may look quite easy to implement and some of them are hugely um, very general things that you know we need to break down even further um, to try and implement but yeah the idea is just to, to find somewhere to start and then then go from there so these are our this is all all the actions this is the first page and then the second slide just shows you a couple that are actually constraints as well rather than actions so inadequate pre-release health screening, difficulties, difficulties with monitoring. And these are all things that, that we're working on. There's not, in this case, there's not short-term targets that we're able to put to them, but you know, we're aware of the mid-term priorities needed to try and address some of these issues. So as you might gather, there's a lot of challenges to do this. Um, well, with reintroductions in general, and this is all linked. Um, so we're looking at the overarching problems for all reintroductions. So 
lack of release sites is a big one um knowledge best you know these things haven't been done before maybe there's not a similar species it's really hard to, to reintroduce or how to go about it even just lack of data on a species and threats um someone asked luke about why uh there are so many species in in south america and well there's not many reintroductions um because I, I think i think a lot of it's simply because of the threats and it's it's so high risk to just release animals into the wild not knowing why they're declining in the first place um i think sometimes you have to do it as an experiment and then see what happens but still it's it's very difficult um and also with monitoring as well the second lot of challenges these are more kind of things that perhaps we face as a, as a group um trying to get people to implement these there's often local or political situations and difficulty getting support locally regionally nationally for these even even people doing this uh, projects to do very well with the programs uh, you ultimately need the support of government or local councils and communities to do the reintroductions um, joining up groups and actions is a very big task uh, for us because um, what we don't want to do is duplicate work but trying to trying to find the time and the people who are working on similar things um, can be a challenge and because we're limited resources trying to work out what we should do first and prioritize uh, can can be difficult and ultimately it's resources uh, myself and Richard do do the co-chair as volunteers the, all of our group is volunteers although some people their jobs are relevant this this stuff is always a sideline people do it evenings weekends and it's and it's hard for people to find the time to do it although we desperately all want to it's it can be difficult to find the resource um, to get things moving but i don't want to be completely uh negative so there are some positives we have had positives within the group i think when we prioritize those actions that was a good first step so we're always evolving with the help of uh, ASG to, to try and streamline these things and just get little things moving. Um, the amphibian reintroduction guidelines, I think, will be a great resource and a really good help, uh, help for people, um, for us and for people trying to implement reintroductions because sometimes I think people feel they're on their own and there's not much support. So I think just having these guidelines and and knowing who to contact um, will really help seeing the case studies as well and as Richard pointed out there there has been an increase in captive breeding I think a lot of that's been for to secure populations and maybe in the future we'll start to see some some of the reintroductions and hopefully that will go hand in hand with things like trying to secure more protected areas and what and a whole range of things that will support that action and a increase in awareness i think there's been a lot of publicity for amphibians and i think hopefully people find them more endearing now and that will really help our cause uh, we've joining up the groups and communities and actions like i say we've worked with the captive breeding group and that's worked really well they're they're actually a very uh, strong group who take the actions forward so that's really helped us who perhaps don't have as many resources as them and we're always learning you know there's more evidence what works in conservation what works in programs husbandry reintroduction techniques that are being published all the time i think what is hard is when they're published in academic journals they're not very open for everyone i think we're seeing more of them in frog log and I don't, i'm not sure if luke mentioned this but we were hoping the reintroduction guidelines would be quite a live document as well where we could share case studies continuously and there was talk of having a database that would help people but overall i would say to anyone here if they need support i'm by no means an expert but 
we probably know someone who is and we could could help you out put you in touch with and try and get support for anyone who's out there thinking uh, you know i've reached a point i don't know what to do or i don't know how to start you know that's a good thing about these acap working groups and the amphibian specialist group they can provide that level of support and we do we are going to have more resources so the good news is that there's been funding secured to employ staff to work on the ACAP on implementing um, actions working more directly with the group getting things off the ground and implemented and that will be taken forward by Detroit Zoo um, and Amphibian Survival Alliance and they will have two part-time members of staff uh, Sally Wren and um, Ruth from Detroit Zoo and they're they both welcome any input and comments people have on the ACAP and yeah I think I think Ruth is already starting to work on it and I know Sally will be from next year so please make a note of their addresses or their they're on the um, amphibians.org website as well or Sally certainly is and you can get in touch with them so that I think will be a really big help having someone driving the ACAP and and kind of giving the groups the help and also a bit of a, a nudge to to get things moving so I'm really happy about that and that's it so it was just a summary of of where we are with the reinstruction group and uh, if anyone has any questions thank you Uh, thanks, uh, Gemma and, uh, and Richard. If there is uh, questions, as before, please raise your hand or post your uh, question in the Q and A uh, box or in the chat box too. So here's a uh, uh, access to Vicky Pool. Go ahead, Vicky. Hey there. Can you hear me? Yes, we do. Um, hey, you guys mentioned the GAA uh, as one of the original things from the original ACAP. And w is there plans to update that in the works? Because some of those evaluations are quite out of date. The, the, the GAA was effectively absorbed into the red list assessment. So uh, when we did the original work, uh, back in 2006, it was a separate database, but then it was absorbed into the red listing uh, process. So it's now all part of the red listing process. Okay, but are those be going to be addressed? Some of those evaluations are so outdated now, especially in light of the, fact I think of the information you just gave. Yeah, the, uh, there's an ongoing process of updating, which uh, is always behind, needless to say. Um, so uh, as a, when the GAA was done, I have to say I was quite skeptical that the ambition to completely assess every single species in the amphibian in the world would be done. And I was actually quite surprised how quickly it was done. Um, so yeah, I think there's an ongoing process for updating, but as new information comes to light, it's, it means that you're, 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 always, you're always tracking behind a bit. Okay, thanks. Vicky, I'm going to add a little bit about uh, that um, because I have been uh, a little bit involved uh, with red listing uh, plus conservationist assessment uh, workshops recently in Latin America and I know they are trying to finish the, the red listing for 2020 uh, the goals they have uh, at least and then they're going to start uh, reassessing everywhere. So five more years of, of assessing uh, or assessments. So I'm sure they will go through the US too. So but it's a matter of, I, I don't know, being patient or something. It's, it's, it's really difficult and they have just four people right now doing all the assessment uh, for more than 8,000 species. 
Tim, thank you. Also, I want to, uh, um, in case you don't uh, have it and paste in in the in the chat box the link for the uh, ACAP, in case you haven't seen it before, you can uh, check on that. So the the uh, goals and actions uh, Gemma was talking about, they are all all in the, in there, and. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure the a few specialist group is also uh, counting with uh, zoos, aquariums, and other ex situ facilities to carry on. Uh, not just the ex situ part of the of the ACAP, but the other parts, uh, education, translocation, and so on. 